Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to class. Um, let's get underway. I'd like to begin with prayers or a volunteer. Please. Amen. Thank you very much. Um, I have copies of the quiz. I'm guessing at this point, most people you don't know it, but here are some. If you want a hard copy, here is here are some. Also, I have uh, the study guide. Most of you have probably seen this. It's on Learning Suite, but again, I have a hard copy if you'd like. And finally, I have a handout regarding hemoglobin. Um, <clears throat> it can serve as a reference to um, explain some features. Uh, I don't expect you to know things on or in this handout that aren't discussed in class. But uh, if they are, this could, can provide some additional information, perhaps to allow you to understand things more clearly. If you need any of these uh, documents, please raise your hand or get one. Okay, we have a fair amount to cover today. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know that I will be able to cover everything um, in terms of content that will be on the exam. We will get through most of it, but some of it uh, may not may not be discussed today. So, but by Friday, uh, I will be able to cover all of the material. Okay, I have scheduled two additional uh, Zoom times review sessions. These, I, I, I sent or attempted to send a, uh, tech, a email to you all, but these are tomorrow and Friday from three till 4.30. I recognize that the, those times will not align with everybody's schedule. I may schedule some additional ones early next week, but if, um, if these do not work for you, please, you're welcome to contact me and we can set up a personal or a group uh, Zoom conference to go over your questions, so. The format of those, let me just briefly say, is to uh, answer your questions. So we will go through the study guide, but I will only make comments on where you have questions. So if you raise it, we'll sort of say, okay, questions for chapter three um, regarding separations, and then you're welcome to ask questions. Yes. It should be in your email box. If not, uh, did let me just, how many got an email? Some did, oh, most of you did. Okay, so if for some reason uh, you don't have, uh, you didn't get it, please email me, swgraves at chem.byu.edu, and I will forward that to you. Yes, the quiz is due Monday, 5, 5 p.m. So, all right, let's go ahead and begin. Uh, at the end of last class, we had talked about, or towards the end of last class, we had talked about this conformational change that happens in tetrameric hemoglobin, okay? So hemoglobin in red blood cells, the hemoglobin that is functional is a tetramer made up of two copies of alpha hemoglobin, two copies of beta hemoglobin. So I want to discuss what happens that leads to this conformational change. 
in deoxyhemoglobin, so if this is the porphyrin ring, okay, uh, looked at from the side on, we will see that the ring is planar. Remember, there's, uh, it is aromatic. It has double bonding. It has delocalization of uh, electron density. And we have an iron. And this iron is iron in its plus two state. Interestingly, this iron, while it, the, uh, while it is trying to fit into the center of the porphyrin ring, it cannot. It's too large to fit completely into the ring. If it fits completely in the ring, then there's optimal overlap between the nitrogens and their lone pairs of electrons and the d orbitals that surround this transition metal ion. But it can't because the effective radius of the iron two is too large to fit completely into the ring. And so this sits somewhat outside the ring. Okay, so that's where we start off. You'll recall that attached to this, through a coordination bond, a transition metal bond, is a nitrogen that is part of the proximal histidine. Let me, not a very good, histidine. So this is, um, this is the proximal histidine and it is in effect, it has a uh, transition metal bond between the imidazole ring of the histidine and this iron. Okay. When oxygen, as oxygen enters, it will bind to the iron forming the sixth ligand, the sixth species bound to the iron. And that binding leads to a reduction in the effective radius of the iron ion. It becomes smaller. The, uh, the, uh, ch there's a change in color that accompanies this. And this, uh, then the iron is able to move into the center of the porphyrin ring. It's going to move, the iron is going to move six tenths of an angstrom. Doesn't sound like much, but it has significant consequences. As the iron moves, so moves the histidine. So this histidine is going to move six tenths of an angstrom. This histidine is part of an alpha helix. Um, and as the histidine moves, uh, the other end of the alpha helix, so as this moves up, this is going to move one angstrom. This is because the, uh, this, uh, the histidine acts as a lever and it is not centered uh, entirely in the middle of the alpha helix. So as we move a small amount at this end, we get a more exaggerated motion at the other end of the alpha helix. This is going to have now some very significant consequences. So let's go back now to this uh, arrangement where we had our tetrameric hemoglobin. You'll recall that along the A2, B2 interface and the B1, A1 interface, there were 35 bonding interactions. The consequence of that is that these two are cemented together 
for all practical purposes. If one moves, they both move. So whatever, yes? In this, it's in between. <laughs> it's a good question, uh, but we'll talk just, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it in, in just a minute. Okay, so, yes? What was the question? Uh, sorry, the question is, is this iron two, as it binds to oxygen, now in the iron three state, or is it still in the iron two state? The answer is, it's in between. Okay, and we'll talk more about that in a sec. Okay, now, as this, uh, as you bind one copy of oxygen to, uh, to this tetrameric hemoglobin, so you occupy just one site, this movement in this uh, F alpha helix causes these two surfaces to slide uh, one against the other. So remember, we had 19 bonding interactions along this, but these are going to slide across one another. And the um, arrangement of the, uh, let's say B1 versus A2 is such that they actually fit together. There is, there, there are hills and dales, uh, and those two copies of protein fit uh, together in a, a very, with, with compatible complementary surface um, contours. When we move uh, this, when we move this alpha helix, it causes these two to move and we will need to move far enough to allow this projection to realign with another indentation here. This can be as much as six angstroms now of molecular movement. Of importance, when this moves, it not only has to find another groove in which to fit, but the chemistry has to continue to be attractive such that you maintain bonding between these two, uh, these two dimeric species. In other words, this doesn't fall apart simply because it moves. It finds other binding interactions as it assumes a different location uh, along the interface of these two proteins. Okay. So oxygen binds, we get this uh, a rather small change here. It's amplified because of the, uh, the alpha helix moving more dramatically, but this disrupts now the interface causing it to move quite substantially. All right, questions? Yes? So on the left side of the board, the oxygen initiates the move by pulling up on the iron? It, it, okay, the question was, does the oxygen initiate the move? Yes, but it doesn't pull it up. It makes it smaller. And the iron wants to fit, uh, it, it, the iron wants to be right in the middle of the ring to optimize overlap of the pairs of electrons on the nitrogens that surround uh, the iron and the open orbitals, uh, d orbitals of the iron ion. So there's a natural tendency for the iron to move anyway, but the oxygen allows it to happen by causing this to become smaller. Yes? Yes. Yes, because this, this binding is so tight, when this moves, this also moves. That, this is six angstroms, okay? Or at least pieces of it move six angstroms. You'll notice that you're gonna get almost no movement here because these are held tightly together along this interface. Yes? Each copy of hemoglobin has a heme group with an iron present. <laughs> Yes, there is a heme group 
located in each of these uh, uh, four copies of this. Okay, or yes. Is the movement in towards the middle radially, or is it like an it, it moves and rotates. So it's up at six angstroms, but it's also 15 degrees of rotation. So you, uh, they slide across one another uh, in that fashion. Yes. Yes, yeah, so to begin with, in the absence of oxygen, the, we would be in the T conformation. With the addition of oxygen, we are primarily, well, at least in terms of crystallographic studies, we are prime, we are, we're, we're in the R conformation. This is what Perutz found is that he could only see two conformations. He was using crystals. So it's a static situation, but nevertheless, he only saw the T and the R. The R is achieved when you have oxygen bound to any one of these, at least in terms of crystallographic studies. The T was only seen with deoxyhemoglobin. Now it's more complicated than that. As so, yes. So. Back to whose ever question it was, it, it brings about, it, there is a transfer of electron density from the iron to the oxygen. And so it's, we go from, we have an equilibrium where we are somewhere between plus two and plus three. Plus three is going to have one less electron and consequently a smaller radius. The addition of an electron to this oxygen places this somewhat in equilibrium with superoxide, which is here. Okay. Now, let me stop. At other questions? Yes. I just want to make sure I ask you right. So when beta or when alpha two is beta one moves because alpha two is beta one, then the shift as well, right? Right. Okay. So this whole, these are so tightly held that when this moves, this also moves. We just, it's going to move together. Okay, a couple things I need to point out before we leave this. One is that this change in conformation, this is what this sliding brings about, is a change in the overall shape of the tetramer has consequences. Not, a, not only is the change in shape, what happens is that it causes the iron in the other three open uh, copies of hemoglobin to bind oxygen more tightly, substantially more tightly, okay? So this is the idea of you have changing oxygen binding affinity. It goes from a low, the deoxy has relatively low oxygen binding affinity, the R conformation, relatively high oxygen binding affinity. Let me ask you a question. Why is the oxygen bound at 120 degrees? Here, any ideas? Yes. Lone pair on the other side. Uh, well, it is because this is sp2 hybridization. So if you think back to your days of molecular orbitals, these lone pairs of electrons are uh, positioned 120 degrees away from the oxygen-oxygen uh, uh, pi system. So this works really well because as we described last time, there is a dome of amino acids, part of the hemoglobin protein, that is that, that are positioned such that there's only a small space for oxygen, and the oxygen fits nicely without being distorted in, uh, at 120 degrees. Another thing to remember is that there was a distal, distal means distant, Proximal means close. 
there is a distal histidine up here um, that is going to hydrogen bond. This is really hard to see. Let me get this up here. There is a histidine up here. So this is our histidine uh, with a hydrogen that's going to hydrogen bond to this oxygen. So uh, the consequence of that is that it stabilizes, oops, um, it's going to stabilize this O minus, actually it'll stabilize the oxygen without a minus, but it's going to stabilize it. And the consequence of that is that um, this is a reversible process. If we actually completely, if we complete this oxidation of iron two to iron three, it will not bind oxygen. Iron three cannot bind oxygen. So while there is a partial loss, if you will, of electron as part of oxygen binding and a partial production of the superoxide ion, it is not a complete transformation. Otherwise, the hemoglobin, that particular heme group could no longer bind oxygen thereafter. So it's a really <laughs> elegant system that allows for the oxygen to be reversibly bound. And at the same time, it also triggers this change in conformation from T to R. Yes. 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 So, if I understand correctly, it's the hydrogen bonding of the other histidine that prevents the iron from becoming the superoxide? Well, it's a further delocalization of electron density that, in, uh, that reduces the reactivity of the oxygen and prevents its complete reduction to superoxide and the complete oxidation of iron two to iron three. Yes. So it stabilizes it to prevent the full electron transfer from happening. Yes. Okay. Okay. okay I'm going to bring up a, some, uh, some slides now and we'll, we'll see this again, I think in these slides, but I think they may help clarify <clears throat> what we're talking about. So, Okay, so first of all, let's just review this conformational change. So on the left, we see the T conformation, on the right, the R. And you'll notice, uh, maybe you won't, but let me point out, um, there are, um, there are very, there's very little uh, movement of, uh, of these subunits along these two axes. Okay, so where the where that line is, you'll notice that the the positions are largely the same one relative to the other. Where we see more dramatic changes up to six angstroms are along these axes here. Okay. And if you'll you can pick out whatever you want. Let's look at this one right here. You see this, okay. Notice where it ends up. It's now down here. Uh, here, it looks like it's fairly close to this. Now it is quite, uh, quite modified into, into terms of what's close to it, okay. So that would be a where we have slid. We've had these two um, subunits slide across one another, repositioning forming new bonds is still holding together, but we have now changed uh, the conformation of the tetramer. Notice that the, there is a fairly large cavity in the center here, in the T state, in the end, the R state really doesn't have an opening, no longer has a cavity between the four tetramers. This has some consequences. 
So here's here's a here's a <laughs> here's a challenge to this notion. So Perutz put out this idea, um, you know, he, uh, in, in looking and studying these two crystal structures, these two solved conformations for crystal structures of the oxyhemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin, uh, he was convinced that there are really only two states. There's T and there's R. And once you've gone, added an oxygen to the system, you go to the R state. So you go from low binding and now you have high binding for everything else. But that is not what is observed in, uh, in uh, nature, okay? And uh, if you recall, and maybe you don't, but if we, um, let me move back to the, Okay, if we, if you recall, if we look at a hill plot, okay, for a hemoglobin, and I'm not going to draw, be able to draw it exactly, we start off with a slope of one, then we had a slope of about three, and then we ended up with a slope of one again. Okay, so this is, would be a plot of log theta, the one minus theta, sort of uh, occupied over free. This is now log of ligand concentration. The ligand here is oxygen. Okay, so this is the partial pressure of oxygen. If perutes were correct, we would, this line would be perpendicular. Okay, we'd only have T or we would have R. But that is not what is observed in nature. This is not what happens experimentally. You have this region where you have progressively increasing oxygen binding affinity. So this first copy of oxygen experiences a single binding affinity. So the first copy of oxygen to bind to the tetramer binds with a single affinity. But then we have this region of progression, progressive oxygen binding affinity, where as we add more oxygen to the system, we have stronger and stronger binding affinity. And the presumption is that by the time you have three oxygens on the hemoglobin tetramer, the final oxygen binds with constant binding affinity. So one, the first one on low binding affinity, the last one on high binding affinity, and then copies two and three go on with variable binding affinity. So what does that mean? Yes. It gets easier to bind. Yeah, well, that is true. And what does that suggest then is happening to the tetramer? You're like moving it in a way that makes it easier to get on, so. It's, yeah, so it continues to have undergo conformational changes, okay? So that is to say that in a static system where you're working with crystals of deoxyhemoglobin and ox oxyhemoglobin, you see just two states. But in solution, in a cell, in a red blood cell, the situation is much more complicated. And we have subtle changes in conformation that lead to increasing oxygen binding affinity. So here's a question. What is causing the increase in binding affinity? Yes. Yes, so the comment or question <laughs> comment was that if you bind one and then you bind a second, so each with each increment of oxygen you bind, you increase the affinity. Yes, why? Yes. 
So when we talk about the movement, does it move in every single bind? Well, like you, you can't observe it as yet. We can't study single tetramers, single complexes in solution. We don't have that ability. We're only able to look at averages in a crystal structure. So we don't exactly know what, what these changes represent, but they're, they're probably more subtle than just going from T to R. But why does the binding affinity go up? Yes. So the, the comment, the answer, uh, is it breaking salt bridges that stabilize one state and cause it to move to another state? There is some of that happening, but the answer, the simple answer is we do not know why there is an increase in binding affinity. Now, the book will say that you push the other irons into those rings, okay? The conformational change now drives the irons into the center of those other three uh, open heme groups. That is not possible. It is not possible. The iron will not, the iron two, in the absence of oxygen, will not fit in a porphyrin ring. Try as you might. Yes. Uh, so the affinity is actually where it, it intersects with the y-axis. So why is that um, slope returns the original value slope? Because the affinity is constant. The slope has to do with cooperativity. This concept of either you either have no cooperativity, constant binding affinity, or you have a region of cooperativity where the binding affinity is variable and increases as increasing oxygen is present. Okay. All right. So let me point out the, the or the statement that's in the middle here to explain oxygen's um, binding to hemoglobin, it must needs be that there is an equilibrium between the T state and the R state. It is not one or the other. There is a constant shift between T and R. Otherwise, we cannot explain any of the phenomenon that we're going to talk about in the next few minutes, okay? So just tuck that away in your mind. It's not, one, it's not a model that is frequently talked about, but it is necessitated by, by uh, this, uh, it is necessitated by what one observes in, uh, in nature, okay? Okay, this describes this, what we talked about earlier. So the F8 histidine, the proximal histidine moves as the iron moves. It moves the entire F helix that causes the slippage of these alpha two beta one and uh, alpha one beta two interfaces. Yeah. Okay. Okay, this, all right. So here again, this, uh, I want to now talk a little bit about how oxygen gets on and how oxygen gets off. So you bind one copy of oxygen to hemoglobin, and now you increase binding affinity for additional copies of oxygen to that, that particular tetramer, okay. So as you can see here in the sort of red area, that is the sort of oxygen tension in the lungs, the partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs. And uh, in the blue uh, over here, this is sort of the partial pressure of oxygen in the peripheral circulation. 
So if you look at this, uh, if, if we look at this, um, the, uh, we have, oops, I didn't want that. Um, if we look at this, we have, oops, about somewhere between typically 95 and 98% loading of oxygen to the hemoglobin in the lung. Okay. Does that make sense? In other words, the partial pressure of oxygen is high enough in the lungs that 95 to 98% of all of the irons have oxygen bound to them. Notice what happens as we move to the peripheral circulation. So let me find my little cursor here. Now we have uh, something on the order of um, maybe three to three to five um, uh, tor of oxygen, and this allows now going we allows us to go from let's say ninety five percent or ninety eight percent down to sixty percent. What that means is I'm able to unload, release about 35% of the oxygen simply as a function of oxygen concentration. So this is an equilibrium, remember? Okay, so more oxygen shifts the equilibrium to favor oxygen bound, less oxygen shifts the equation back um, to favor oxygen coming off. Let me ask you this, uh, let's say we get here to a position, uh, to a partial pressure of four. How many copies of oxygen are still bound to the hemoglobin? Two, okay, approximately two. Now remember, Perutz's model was that if you have one copy of oxygen, you're in the R conformation. This is the R conformation up here, okay? When it says high affinity, we're talking about the R state. So how much oxygen comes off according to Perutz's model? None. It is incompatible with life. So even though we still have at least two copies of oxygen, we're getting oxygen off. How is that possible if it's bound so tightly? So we have the high affinity binding curve up at, oop, up at the top here. Low affinity binding curve would be, let's say for the T conformation. What we have, what we must have is this constant, uh, this constant equilibrium between T and R. What we're seeing is how much time the tetramer is spending in the T state or R state. It's not either or, it is a distribution that we're observing, okay? Yes? Oh, because there's still 60% occupancy. 0.6 means that 60% of my irons have oxygen on them, okay? That's at least two oxygens. I only need one to put it in the R state according to Perutz. So it should be in the high binding affinity state where you cannot get the oxygen off uh, easily. Someone else had a hand up. Yes. So you're saying it's shifting, it's like an equilibrium. Does that mean the molecule or the, like the, the parts are shifting back and forth? Yes. Crazy. But that's, that's the only way you can explain this. Okay, this is just one of several things that are hard to explain if you have just R and T. So you have to be able to uh, sample both of those conformations on a frequent basis to be able to explain what, we're, well, what we see course, in nature. Like the electron density where it's kind of like a mix between the two orbitals where it's kind of sharing almost. Well, the, the difference in oxygen binding affinity is more than just the conformational change um, because we really don't understand why the conformational change actually causes the other irons that don't have oxygen present at the time 
to bind oxygen more tightly than the first one going on. Okay. So there's something about the conformal, conformational change that increases oxygen binding affinity. Is it an interaction with the ring? Is it an interaction with the distal histidine? Is there some other factor? Don't know. Yes? So if I'm understanding this graph correctly, it's essentially comparing three different models of blood activity as far as like the binding. No. What it's showing is the R state, if that were all that were present, that's the high affinity state, or the T state, the low affinity state, what you see in the middle is reality. That is what you see, observe experimentally if you actually do a titration uh, of the, uh, the hemoglobin. Okay, we need to move on. <clears throat> One of the ways in which oxygen binding is influenced is by the pH of the uh, interior of the red blood cell. Metabolism, that is active, uh, active use of energy within cells leads to the production of carbon dioxide and water. So as with other, it happens in a much more subtle way than simply burning the cookies in the oven. There you have smoke, sometimes you have fire, in cells, this happens in incremental ways, but nevertheless, in the end, we produce both carbon dioxide and water. The carbon dioxide is going to diffuse out of red blood cells, I mean, out of tissue cells. It is a symmetric nonpolar molecule. It can pass through cell membranes and so it moves from a, an actively, uh, a metabolically active cell into the interstitial space, from there into the circulation, from there into the red blood cell. This is a, these distances are very short, but if you um, pass red blood cells through a part of the body, through the circulation of a, an actively a metabolically active tissue, there will be more carbon dioxide diffused into the red blood cell. Okay, so what is the consequences of that? Well, it, it turns out that, turns out that the carbon, so we have, we have our cell that is producing carbon dioxide. It's metabolically active. This goes into the interstitial space on into the circulation. Here's a red blood cell. It will enter the red blood cell and inside the red blood cell, it is converted into carbonic acid. There is an enzyme called an, uh, carbonic anhydrase that facilitates, uh, catalyzes this reaction about a million fold. And consequently, CO2 is combined with water to produce carbonic acid, H2CO3. This is a reversible process. This carbonic acid, in turn, will react with water reversibly to produce hydronium ion, acidity, and bicarbonate. So as we breathe, uh, as, we, as we are more, as we carry out more metabolism, as we burn more energy, we produce more CO2, which in turn produces greater acidity. The consequence of that is shown in uh, in this slide. So there is something called the Bohr effect. 
If you look at that equation, you will see that as you increase H plus acidity, hydronium ion, you cause more oxygen to be released. Okay, you're following what's happening? So more acidity, lower pH, results in a shift in this equilibrium to favor oxygen free, uh, being freed from hemoglobin. So think about this. This is ideal. If I have actively respiring, active, metabolically active tissue, it creates more CO2, which increases acidity, which leads to more oxygen release in that tissue at that time. So we have this way to modulate oxygen binding affinity that meets our immediate needs. So this has profound consequences. If I'm climbing the hill from the duck pond and you know my legs are working hard, they're starting to ache, I am going to deliver more oxygen to that particular vascular bed and tissue because of the Bohr effect. Yes. Is the just like the increase in pH or is it possibly carbon dioxide? It is due, uh, the change in pH is due to carbon dioxide. Okay. Being converted into carbonic acid, more carbonic acid, more acidity, and now we release more oxygen. Okay. So how does this happen? What does this do? How is acidity going to bring about a, a change in oxygen binding affinity? It turns out most likely, again, this is something that is still under investigation, that the acidity leads to a histidine, not the proximal histidine, not the distal histidine, but a histidine on that interface, the beta two alpha one or the alpha one beta two interface it's going to cause a histidine to become more positively charged. That positive charge on the histidine is going to, under, uh, to uh, interact favorably with a negatively charged species on the other copy of hemoglobin on the other side of this interface. And that stabilizes the T conformation. It makes it more stable. It doesn't put it permanently in the T conformation, but it causes the tetramer to spend more time in the T conformation. T conformation means lower oxygen binding affinity, more oxygen escapes into the tissues to meet the needs of metabolically active tissues. Okay, questions about this? Yes? Is that just like the nitrogen on the histidine is acting as a base and taking up another hydrogen? Yes. So that is assuming that the histidine is acting as a base and we are increasing the amount of positive charge on it. So, in, you know, it may be incremental, but it's enough that it, all, it now stabilizes. Uh, it, it causes this partial positive charge to be on the histidine, which stabilizes the T conformation allowing the tetramer to spend more time in the T conformation, allowing more oxygen to come off. Yes? So would it be fair to think about it as the, the oxygen describes tissues and that it has to itself? Right. So the hemoglobin is responding to its environment. And in this case, the environment is dictated by what's happening in those cells uh, of that particular vascular, that particular tissue and vascular bed, yes? So you could assume that if you are laying, if you are couch potatoing all day, your hemoglobin is going to be more oxygen rich than if you were running around? Is that yes, that? that is probably true. Uh, so if you think about it, even within your, even, you know, so let's say in my earlobe, the, you know, the amount of metabolism happening there is pretty limited. So it's, its pH is going to be substantially higher. Uh, 
than my skeletal muscle in my legs if I'm climbing stairs. So I'm going to deliver a much smaller amount of oxygen to my earlobe, but it's sufficient for its needs because it's not doing anything. On the other hand, where I'm producing lots of CO2, I'm going to deliver substantially more oxygen to that tissue that needs it. So this is, um, so it meets our needs in real time and it's site specific within our body. Yes. It doesn't change back to the T conformation. It spends more time in the T conformation. You're going back and forth all the time or this doesn't make any sense at all. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, now, it turns out that about 40% of the acidity is transported to the lungs and kidney via the proton binding to some histidine. When it gets to the lungs, this whole process is reversed. And consequently, we're able to release the, the added acidity. We're also going to be able to release the carbon dioxide from this. Okay, we are really out of time. I apologize, but uh, we're going to, yes, go ahead. Yeah, we will talk more about this. We still have a few more things to talk about. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Sorry that I ran over a little bit here. So.